Palin may be losing support among a key group of voters, women. 34% now have a favorable view of the Republican vice presidential nominee. That is down 13 points in two weeks. Meanwhile, Governor Palin wrapped up her trip to New York City today, stopping by a visitor center dedicated to 9-11 victims and a firehouse next door. This week, I met with her a few miles north of Ground Zero at the United Nations. Much of our discussion focused on foreign policy, which some say could be her weakness. Here now, part two of my exclusive interview with Sarah Palin. As we stand before this august uh, building and, and institution, what do you see as the role of the United States in the world? Mm, I see the United States as being a force for good in the world. And as Ronald Reagan used to talk about, America being the beacon of light and hope for those who are seeking democratic values and tolerance and freedom. And I see our country being able to represent those things that can be looked to as um, that leadership, that light needed across the world. In preparing for this conversation, a lot of our viewers and, and internet users wanted to know why you did not get a passport until last year. And they wondered if it indicated a lack of interest and curiosity in the world. I'm not one of those who maybe came from a background of, you know, kids who perhaps graduate college and their parents get them a passport and give them a backpack and say, go off and, and travel the world new. No, I've worked all my life. In fact, I've usually had two jobs all my life until I had kids. I was not uh, uh, a part of, I guess, that culture. The way that I have understood the world is through education, through books, through um, mediums that have provided me a, a lot of perspective on the world. Uh. Governor Palin, we've had a very busy week and you're meeting with many world leaders. You met with President Karzai of Afghanistan. I know the McCain campaign has called for a surge in Afghanistan, but that country is, as you know, dramatically different than Iraq. Why do you believe additional troops, U.S. troops, will solve the problems there? Because we can't afford to lose in Afghanistan, as we cannot afford to lose in Iraq either. These uh, central fronts on the war on terror. And I asked President Karzai, is that what you are seeking also? That strategy that has worked in Iraq that John McCain had pushed for, more troops, a counterinsurgency strategy. And he said yes. And he also showed great appreciation for what America and American troops are providing in his country. The United States is deeply unpopular in Pakistan. Do you think the Pakistani government is protecting al-Qaeda within its borders? I don't believe that new President Zadari has that mission at all. But um, no, the Pakistani people also, they want freedom. They want democratic values to be allowed in their country also. They understand the dangers of terrorists having a stronghold in regions of their country also. And I believe that they too want to rid not only their country, but the world of violent Islamic terrorists. You've cited Alaska's proximity to Russia mm -hmm. as part of your foreign policy experience. What did you mean by that? That Alaska has a very narrow maritime border between a foreign country, Russia, and on our other side, the land uh, boundary that we have with uh, Canada. It, it's funny that a comment like that was uh, kind of made to, um, care, I don't know, you know, reporters. Mocked. Yeah, mocked, I guess that's the word, yeah. Um, well, explain to me why that enhances your foreign policy credentials. Well, it certainly does because our our next door neighbors are foreign countries. They're in the state that I am the executive of. And have you ever been in involved with any negotiations, for example, with the Russians? We have trade missions back and forth. We we do. It's very important when when you consider even national security issues with Russia, as Putin rears his head and, and uh, comes into the airspace of the United States of America, where, where do they go? It, it's Alaska, it's just right over the border. It is from Alaska that we send those out to make sure that an eye is being kept on this very powerful nation, Russia, because they are right there. They are right next to, um, to our state. When President Bush ran for office, he opposed 
nation building, but he has spent, as you know, much of his presidency promoting democracy around the world. What lessons have you learned from Iraq and how specifically will you try to spread democracy throughout the world? Specifically, we will make every effort possible to help spread democracy for those who desire freedom, independence, uh, tolerance, um, respect for equality. Uh, that, th that is the whole goal here in, in fighting terrorism also, is not just to keep the people safe, but to be able to usher in democratic values and ideals around the, around the world. We met with former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who is for direct diplomacy with both Iran and Syria. Do you believe the U.S. should negotiate with leaders like President Assad and Ahmadinejad? I think with Ahmadinejad personally, he is not one to negotiate with. You can't just sit down with him with no preconditions being met. Barack Obama is so off base in his uh, proclamation that he would meet with some of these leaders around our world who would seek to destroy America and that and without preconditions being met. That's beyond naive and it's beyond bad judgment. So are you it's, saying it's Henry dangerous. Kissinger is naive for supporting Hen that? I've never heard Henry Kissinger say, yeah, I'll meet with these leaders with, without preconditions being met. Diplomacy is about doing a lot of background work first and shoring up allies and positions and figuring out what sanctions perhaps could be implemented if things weren't going to go right. That's, that's part of diplomacy. You recently said three times that you would never, quote, second-guess Israel if, if that country decided to attack Iran. Why not? We shouldn't second-guess Israel's security efforts because we cannot ever afford to send a message that we would allow a second Holocaust, for one. Israel has got to have the opportunity and the ability to protect itself. They are our closest ally in the Mideast. We need them, they need us, and we shouldn't second guess their effort. You don't think the United States is within its rights to express its position to Israel? And if, if that means second guessing or discussing an option? No, absolutely. We need to express our right and our concerns. And um, But you said never second guess them. We don't have to second guess what their efforts would be if they believe that it is, that it is in their country and their allies, including us, all of our best interests to fight against a regime, especially Iran, who would seek to wipe them off the face of the earth. It, 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 it is obvious to me who the good guys are in this one and who the bad guys are. The bad guys are the ones who say Israel is a stinking corpse and should be wiped off the face of the earth. That's not a good guy who is saying that. Now, one who would seek to protect the good guys in this, the leaders of Israel and her friends, her allies, including the United States. In my world, those are the good guys. Incidentally, we confirmed Henry Kissinger's position following our interview. He told us he supports talks, if not with Ahmadinejad, then with high-level Iranian officials without preconditions. You can see more of my interview with Governor Palin on our website.